All right, our scripture for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer together. Lord God, as we reflect on this moment and the last days of your life, Help us, Lord, to be calm, to be still. Help us to listen and be available for what you're saying to us. As we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And God, we rest on the promise that you will never forsake us. You will never leave us. You will be with us always. And so, Lord, as we listen and we receive the word of God, may it impact us, may it change us from within. May we become more like you. May we live with you, and may we do as you have done. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give our pastor, Matt, a hand as we have a seat. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for getting up early this morning at 5 a.m. to get ready for our time together, or at least from Theo's perspective, (laughs) he wanted to get you up early. But just think a couple weeks ago, that would have been 4 a.m. All right, so... uh, Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. 4 a.m. There we go. I got it right. Hey, good morning and happy Palm Sunday to everybody. And uh, my name is Matt, if we've not yet met. And this is my favorite time of the year, not because of March Madness, but I do love me some college basketball. And uh, our very own San Diego State Aztecs are playing tonight against a uh, basketball powerhouse called Yale. All right, maybe not a basketball powerhouse, but they won their first game somehow. And uh, so we're playing them tonight. So uh, I welcome you. Let's watch together. All right, we'll do that. Um, It's my favorite week because it's the most significant week in the year uh, from a Christian perspective. Uh, Holy Week. And Holy Week begins on today, Palm Sunday, which marks the occasion many years ago when Jesus rode triumphantly on a donkey. Not Not a majestic war horse, but a donkey into the city of Jerusalem, where he had been spending time, uh, he'd been to Jerusalem on many times and many occasions. And in fact, um, Jesus would often say to people like, hey, don't let anyone else know that I've done this for you because it's not, it's not time. He tells his mom when he, right before he performs his first miracle, it's not time yet. It's not time for the Son of Man to be revealed. It's not time, it's not time, it's not time. Uh, so, uh, it's G14 classified, keep it under wraps, and people would go and talk about who he is, and crowds began to follow him. But at this point in the journey, Jesus is saying, it's time. It is time for me to confront both the evil that exists in the religious system of the world that, is, that, that exists in the temple in Jerusalem, this, this incredible, holy, sacred place, and it's time for me to take a stand against the evil that exists in you and in the world. It's time, Jesus is saying. That's what his triumphal entry uh, represents. He knows the cost of it. 
He knows that in taking the stand, he is going to be put to death. He's going to suffer and die. He's going to drink from the cup of suffering, from the cup of, of wrath. And yet, in courage, he's, he just sets his focus in utter dependence on his father and says, it is time. Can I just tell you today, I don't know what it is you're navigating through, what challenges you're going through, but God wants you to know it's time. It's time. It's time for you to take a stand. It's time for you to say enough is enough. I'm taking a stand. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to take, in this context of the conversation we're having, I'm going to take this journey of forgiveness. I'm going to take this journey of forgiveness. Uh, by the way, as I get started, I just remembered that I saw a flood celebrity today when we were going through our long process of building out this building and working with the city of San Diego that was as fun as it sounds. Uh, God provided us with a, a guy named Frank who's here today who would watch our building at night. We'd had a break in. People were trying to get copper. Copper's really valuable. And so uh, we had uh, Frank on duty uh, most nights. And Frank, uh, first time I've seen Frank in a couple years, but it's good to see Frank today. There's Frank. Frank, thanks for watching our building. So good to have you here with us today. Flood celebrity shout out as we get started, right? So the Lord wants us to know it's time. It's time. And uh, as we think about this today, we're talking about the journey of forgiveness. That's the conversation we've been having. Uh, forgiveness uh, in a world that's marked by hurting. Hurt is natural. To be hurt, to hurt others is natural. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. To forgive is supernatural. The way we've been saying it in the series is 70 times seven, referencing Jesus saying to his disciples, this is how many times you, you need to forgive, as many times as it takes, 70 times seven. To, to err is human, we fall short. I don't say that as an excuse. To err is human, to forgive is divine. So we've been talking about how do we experience and express the miracle of forgiveness in our lives? How do we experience and express the miracle of forgiveness in our lives? And specifically, how do we forgive from the heart? How do we forgive from the heart? Because last week I named, not only is there a lack of forgiveness in our culture, there's a lack of forgiveness oftentimes in the church, or if there is forgiveness, oftentimes it's a shallow, superficial forgiveness. We forgive because we know we're supposed to. We forgive because it's, it's the right thing. We forgive because we don't want to go through the time and energy it takes to enter into naming a, a wrong that we've experienced and walking with another person through that. We live in a culture that's like, hey, we don't have time for pain. We don't have time to sit with this. Let's just move on. Let's just move forward. And I'm all for moving on. Believe me, the last place I want to be is camped out somewhere in emotional pain. I, I, I'm all for moving on. But to move on truly and fully into freedom requires that we're willing to do the work of partnering with God to name and grieve our hurts and losses. Not pretend like they didn't happen. Not stuff them down like a beach ball in a swimming pool. Like I'm just going to hold this down here. And it's going to end up coming out sideways, right? So the problem of superficial or shallow forgiveness, which minimizes the wrong done. And it's not true. It's not a lasting forgiveness. So again, how do we forgive from the heart? And I said this last week, and I want to camp here today, and that is this. We forgive from the heart by grieving from the heart. To forgive well means to grieve well. To grieve well means to grieve in a healthy way, right? Paul says we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. God is the most joyful being in the universe. And so his people, me and you, should be marked consistently by joy. And in the midst of that, being marked by joy, we're also people who are open to responding to the brokenness in us, in others, and in the world through lament, through grieving what, what is. Uh, as C.S. Lewis said that we, we need to bring to God not what we ought to bring to God, but what is truly in us. Because the oughts get in the way of us speaking, facing, and feeling the truth. As a Christian, I ought to forgive. So we use that as a band-aid to cover over the deep hurt we've actually experienced, which keeps us from something that's really important, 
called reality. We meet God in reality. God is a God of truth. And he's like, hey, Matt, I see you. I see what you're wrestling with. I see what, what the hurts that have been done to you. I see the hurts that you've done. And so let's look at that. Let's grieve that. And so that's what we're looking at today. To grieve well or to forgive well means we grieve well. And the biblical framework, the theological framework for grieving in a healthy way is death, burial, and resurrection. What does grieving, good grief, look like? It looks cruciform. It's Jesus-shaped. It's cross-shaped. It's, it's, cross it's a cruciform journey of death, burial, and resurrection. And next week, especially, we are celebrating with the church all over the world the joy of the resurrection of Jesus. But before we get there fully, let's walk through this process. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy movies. I'm a, I'm a movie buff. Roxanne and I, a couple weeks ago, got to see uh, Dune 2. It wasn't an IMAX, which is important, uh, which was, uh, IMAX was sold out. Anyone see Dune 2 in IMAX? All right. Well, all right. Then just like, hey, you saw it on a standard string, Matt. Not only did I see it in IMAX, but I saw it on 70 millimeter. In fact, I sat with the director. <laughs> Uh, I was there. He's giving me inside scoops on why they shot a scene the certain way. It's like, okay, Joe, I get you. I, saw, I, I get you. you. Here's the thing. When it comes to Dune 2, Joe wins. All right. I'm just acknowledging that. I like to win. I, I didn't win. All right. But it was a good movie. Uh, one of the classics, if, you, if you're surfing on, on, on TV, is uh, Titanic will come on. Right? And, and not to go all into Titanic, but one of the things Titanic illustrates is that what, what's going on below surfaces. What's going on below, right, below deck, where, 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 where they hit the iceberg and the wa- they start taking on water, everything on the top deck is like, hey, we're good. Jesus is alive, right? This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah but what about that boom? What about that wound that you, what wound? I'm good. I've moved on. You're like, uh, it seems like you're taking on water. Oh, no. Oh, I'm good. I, well, give me a verse. I, oh, you, you, yeah, you, you wronged me? Oh, I forgive you. But do you though? Because you're, you're taking on water and you seem like there's some resentment and some bitterness and oh, I'm not bitter. I'm not angry either. I'm, I'm actually really good, all right? Because what's below comes out. Like that beach ball we put underwater, we can put pressure on it. Like I'm not gonna acknowledge this. It's gonna come out and it'll often come out sideways. So, grief when we've been hurt, when we've been wronged. And again, I said last week, I wanna say it again. There's a difference between grieving a wrong and overlooking an offense. Someone cuts me off on the freeway, that person may be a piece of work, they may be having a bad day. Do I need to forgive them? Probably not. I might wanna bless them, but like I, I just probably just need to let, let that go. Right? There's times on the minor things of life, you just overlook an offense. Right? We, we said that, you have to ask, was this a one-time thing? And, and it could have been a one-time thing that was very serious and significant, and that requires a ju- of forgiveness. Is it a pattern? Is it like this, I call this Monday or Tuesday, or th- there's a consistent pattern in this way of you responding in hurtful ways. Or is it your character? There's something that needs to be addressed in you that you aren't addressing. So that, that's... That's important for us to know. And uh, so the f- number one is we, uh, I said, C.S. Lewis said this, we should bring to God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. The oughts will keep us from telling and feeling the truth. I said that, but I wanted to reiterate that. So how do we grieve well so that we can forgive from the heart? Number one, uh, the first phase of grieving well is death. It's paying attention to your losses. Paying attention to the way in which you've been hurt in life. Um, Sometimes people will say, and by people I mean pastors, that the decision to forgive is simply an act of our will. It's just a choice we make, regardless of the severity of the injustice. When When we say that, we don't understand the larger biblical narrative of the importance of grief and loss. In order to truly forgive each other from our hearts, we must first feel the pain of what was lost and allow God to lead us through the confusing in-between phase of grief. 
when Jesus gave, gives his life for us to forgive us, he doesn't say, well, they did their best. They couldn't help it. He was not detached and void of emotions. Rather, Jesus truly felt the pain of our rebellion and unwillingness to believe and receive him. As he hung alone on the cross and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And so on this slide behind me, we see this journey of forgiveness. I want to give you this quick overview, the journey of forgiveness. Uh, so we begin with naming and experiencing bl blankness. Oh, okay, there we go. Hurts and losses. We call those deaths, many deaths. It could be a betrayal. It could be an abrupt departure. Like I thought we were going to be friends for life, except now we're not. And I don't even understand why or what happened. Or I do understand what happened, but we haven't addressed it. This person just chose to cut me off. Inf infidelity, unfaithfulness, breaking a promise. Not, and not only the things we do, but the things we sometimes fail to do. Uh, call to protect and provide for each other. To speak up and advocate on one another's behalf. And, and, and that wasn't there. Lack of attention, lack of meaningful affection, lack of prioritizing the relationship and cultivating meaningful connection, losses. Then the second phase is burial. And burial is marked by what feels, can feel like darkness, like there's nothing happening, like burial can feel stuck in a place we don't wanna be. But what's happening in burial is God is emptying us if we cooperate with him. He's emptying us from false attachments, from overly relying on things that, 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 uh, that, that, that aren't reliable, right? That's burial. Uh, and then lastly, we, we get to the good news uh, of resurrection, of acknowledging the hurt and loss, walking through a process of grieving so that God opens our hearts. He enlarges our souls. We're more sensitive and responsive to him. There's a clarification of priorities so that we can be open to what's next, to what's new. The good thing that God wants to, and circumstances might not even be that different, but that what's next is what God is doing, what God is developing, what God is birthing in you and I. Newness, openness, greater clarity. Greater empathy for each other. And here's the thing. If you're anything like me, when I experience a hurt, a wrong, a loss, I want to just move on, right? Let's just get, what's the next best thing that's coming up? Let's focus there. Let's get to the new beginning. Let's not pay attention to the loss. That's not fun. That requires work. Who wants to be sad? So we just move on and we skip this process, which God will bring us right back to it. We'll experience another hurt, another loss. And God's like, okay, Matt, you're gonna walk with me through this? Nope, I'm gonna leap across. Get to the other side, move on, focus on the positive, which is a great gift on one sense, but can become a hindrance when God's inviting us to do a deeper work through this process of death and burial that leads to resurrection. So as we talk about that, we, we come to this amazing account post uh, Palm Sunday. Now Jesus is Thursday. He's had a Passover, the last meal with his closest friends. Now he's led them, as, as uh, Luke says in his gospel, as usual, as usual, Jesus goes to this spot. As usual, this is a familiar spot to Jesus. What? The Garden of Gethsemane, the place of olive pressing. Jesus goes there. So Jesus, when he would go to Jerusalem for the big uh, feasts and festivals, that the Jewish people knew how to party. They wouldn't party for a day. They'd be like, this is a week. It's a wedding. It's a week. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a week. It's Pentecost. It's a week. Like, let's, we can't do this in a day. Let's, it's a week. So when Jesus would go to these parties, these festivals, as he would as a regular rhythm of his life, as a kid with his parents, remember he's 12 and he stays back. He's like, hey, the party's not over. I'm staying here in the temple. And they, they leave and they're like, hey, where are you? You've been missing for three days. You know what you just did to us as your mom and dad? And he's like, just really clear. He's like, hey, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but I'm doing what I've been called to do. Uh, now don't misuse that, but you get the idea. So when he'd go to Jerusalem, he would stay at the, his, his oikos in Jerusalem. His extended family was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
He'd stay at their house in Bethany. Bethany is 1.75 miles from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, 1.7 miles east. And uh, uh, actually, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus lived 1.76 miles, but if you want to get technical, but I actually don't know that, but I just want to be, be a <laughs> biblical dork. Uh, and so they would stay the night with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, Martha would prepare a great feast, as we know she, she, she loved to do. She's great, very hospitable. She gets stressed out about it sometimes, but that's all right. She was working. She was, she was doing some serious kingdom work. Uh, and then they would walk, they'd wake up, and they'd walk um, up the Mount of Olives from Bethany, up the Mount of Olives, heading west, down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and up into the temple in Jerusalem, the temple courts, 1.75 miles. So Jesus is now near the temple in John Mark's house where the Last Supper's taking place. John Mark's name, mom's name was also Mary. Don't get confusing. Don't get confused. There's a lot of Marys. Uh, they're at their house for the Last Supper. Then late at night, they leave. Remember, Lazarus leaves. Go and do what you're going to do. Lazarus leaves the, the dinner party at the end to, be, to betray Jesus. And they, the, Jesus and the disciples, it says Jesus leads them as usual to the Garden of Gethsemane. If it got too late at night and they didn't have time to go all the way back to Bethany, they'd go across the Kidron Valley at the base of the Mount of Olives and stay in this olive orchard. This olive orchard exists in Israel today. And some people are like, yeah, those olive trees were there when Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That sounds great. They're over a thousand years old, some of these trees. It's the oldest olive grove in the world, right? But do, do they date back to the time of Jesus? No, because Josephus, Josephus the Jewish historian tells us, nerd alert, Jos Josephus tells us that um, when Rome conquered Israel, Jerusalem in 70 AD, they cut down all the trees on the Mount of Olives, just laid waste. They didn't want to leave no stone unturned. We're going to decimate you. All right. So they go to this place. In fact, there's a cave near this olive grove where they've uncovered, archaeologists have uncovered olive presses from the first century. The place of pressing where they would use these large stones. They would roll them over olives to press for olive oil. In this place of intense pressing and pressure, Jesus is there with his disciples. And he knows what's coming. And he says this, and I appreciate Jason reading. I want to read this passage to you, an excerpt of it, Matthew 26 through 36 through 38, a couple of times. Number one, or hear God's word to us today. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. He's asking. He's pleading. He's begging his father, take this cup from me. This cup of suffering. If there's another way, I want a different way. I don't want to go through what's coming. Jesus in the fullness of his humanity is just being real and honest and sober about the reality he faces. Is there anything in your life right now that you're saying, Lord, this, do something about this, take this, solve this, fix this, change this circumstance, this cup, Lord, I don't want this cup. Take it, change it. I'm going to read that passage again. I just want you to receive God's word to you today. Hear what the Lord is saying to you through this amazing, powerful moment in Jesus' life. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, the place of olive pressing. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Take this cup. Honesty of naming and grieving loss. The hurt that is coming. The wrong that's going to be done to him as he takes on my sin and your sin and the sin of the world. This morning I was listening to a reflection on Palm Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday passage in Mark. And the question was asked, is there anything you want to say today to this humble king? for the suffering he's about to face. On this Palm Sunday, as we commemorate this event that begins Holy Week, is there anything you want to say to this humble king for the suffering he's going to endure for your sake? Is there anything you want to say? today to this humble king who is the king of kings. He's the way, the truth, and the life for the suffering he's going to walk through on your behalf and my behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you, Lord, that when I question your love for me, I, it, you can take me back to Calvary and I could see your love poured out for me. No good thing do you withhold. And so Jesus models for us good grief, as Charlie Brown used to say. Good grief, Charlie Brown, right? Good grief. Godly sorrow is what Paul calls it when he writes to the church at Corinth. Not worldly sorrow, but godly sorrow. And so as we, as we learn to forgive from our hearts, we have to grieve the hurts that have been done and the hurts that we've done to others. We need to lament the brokenness in us, the brokenness in others, and the brokenness in the world. And I, I mentioned this the uh, last couple of weeks when that counselor when I was in college said to me, Matt, you have to grieve this relationship that you desire with your mom that's just not going to happen. You got to grieve it. You got you to gotta let it go. Well, let what go? This, what you're wanting, because what you're wanting is not going to happen. As John Townsend said, uh, John Townsend, Henry Cloud, wrote a, bunch, a series of books called Boundaries. John Townsend says this, grief is God's solution for accepting what we cannot change. Grief is God's solution for accepting what you, we cannot change. That's what that counselor was saying to me. You can't change this person. So you got to grieve. you got to pay attention to it. So what is, in fact, Jesus, uh, as he's approaching Jerusalem in Palm Sunday, Luke 19, 41, says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, so he's coming over the Mount of Olives east of, of Jerusalem, and when you get over the ridge, you, you look directly down on the Temple Mount. The temple's there in all its glory. And he sees that, he's overwhelmed, it says, it, he saw the city and weeps over it because he knows in their stubbornness and pride they're rejecting the gift of God's forgiveness. They're, they're gonna, they're, the, the, instead of expressing godly sorrow, they're expecting worldly sorrow and they're saying, Lord, you need to change this. You need to kick these Romans out of here. And Jesus knows that that way of the world is gonna lead to their destruction. Just a few decades after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, there was a uh, Israeli resistance, a Jewish resistance to Rome. And Rome's like, okay, that's how this is gonna go. The most powerful fighting force the world had ever seen. And they laid waste to the temple. So Jesus knows that's coming and grieves it. He's, he wants it to be different. And yet he knows that's the way it's gonna go. He models for us godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is bad grief. Worldly sorrow is 
feeling bad. It's shaming and isolating. It's feeling insignificant, unworthy of love. It's self-rejection, self-hating, and very isolating. Whereas godly sorrow, that's worldly sorrow, godly sorrow is to feel sad, to feel convicted, to feel sorrowful, to feel apologetic, to feel remorseful, to feel contrite, to feel regret, to take responsibility for my actions and to grieve it. See, the invitation is not for, you should really feel bad for the things, no, you should feel sad. Feeling sad is better than feeling bad because feeling sad leads to growth and forgiveness and redemption. So feel your hurt. Be emotionally honest. All right. There's a way to practice this. Practice what? Being in touch with what's going on inside of us. It's called the iceberg exercise, right? What's below is gonna come out. So how do we get into with God? It's not just feeling sad, but it's feeling sad and naming that to God in a trusted, ideally a trusted friend, a safe person. I feel really sad about it. So the iceberg questions are just a way of checking in to how our souls are doing. It's this, what are you mad about? You got some time? What are you sad about? What are you anxious about? What are you glad about? Right, got it? What are you sad about? Or what are you mad about? What are you sad about? What are you anxious or fearful about? What are you glad about? Now, Roxanne and I practiced this personally and sometimes together, and we were taking a walk uh, a couple months ago, and we we're doing the, hey, how'd you do on the iceberg exercise this week? And we're just walking through in real time. We didn't, hadn't written anything out yet. We're just thinking about it. You can do that. Uh, as an extrovert, sometimes I don't know what I think or feel until I'm talking about it. But, uh, so we're walking, and I started with gladness, because who doesn't want to start with the good? what you're glad about, then I realized the wisdom of not starting with gladness because <laughs> it's just a good note to end on. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, I got to name some hard stuff, but here's what I'm really glad and thankful for, right? So that's just, there's a process to it. So again, what am I sad about? Small or big loss, small or big hurt, a disappointment, a choice I or someone else has made that's caused pain. That's what I'm sad about. What are you anxious about? My finances, our, my, our, 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 your finances, your future, your family, your health. What are you, what are you anxious about? Oh, I skipped from mad. What are you angry about? A betrayal, a hurtful comment, a car breakdown? You're like, why, why do you be angry about a car breakdown? One, it's frustrating, but maybe your car's been, you know, given indications, like with the lights on the thing, like, hey, something's wrong, you should pay attention to me. And we're like, no, nah, I'll get to it eventually. And then you break down, or you maybe you express it to someone in your family who's like, their responsibility is to make sure the car's doing well. You're like, hey, something's not right. Uh, do you, have you heard Jessica's, br- uh, hypothetically, have you heard Jessica's, br- I know you just had Jessica's brakes done, but they're still squeaking. I think you should take it back to the mechanic. I'm like, ah, I, I will eventually. Now, if that breaks down, like, there could be someone in our household that could be angry at someone else in our household, right? That's what I'm saying. Car breakdown, what are you mad about? I'm frustrated that I didn't take care of it, or I'm frustrated that you didn't take care of it. You know what I'm saying? Hypothetically. <laughs> and then what are you glad about? What are you glad about? Uh, I'm glad about my family. I'm glad about March Madness. I'm glad about this new opportunity. I'm glad glad about the people in my small group. I'm really glad about my church and the good things God's doing there. What are you glad about? I'm glad about that in May I get to go fly fishing for the first time. Do you see that? I have no idea what I'm doing. But I'm going fly fishing in Montana with grizzly bears. It's gonna be fantastic. I'm glad about that. I'm really looking forward to that. I'm glad that I'm going back to Malawi, Lord willing, this summer if I get my passport renewed. I'm glad about that, right? So what are you glad about? That's, That's, so end there. We with iceberg, okay. That's a part of feeling our losses. Okay, secondly, oh, we gotta go faster. Burial. Burial is about waiting and the confusing in between. I asked someone recently, I'm like, yeah, but when you're in that burial phase of grieving, what are you supposed to be doing? Life's still happening. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's still bills to be paid. There's still kids that need to be attended to. There's still, right, you're still living life but you're in this place of grieving where it's burial, where it feels like, what, yeah, but what am I doing? You're waiting on God to do the work in you that only he can do in you. God, I need you, but where are you? It feels dark, it feels empty. God's emptying me of my unhealthy attachments, of, my, of, of putting too much of an emphasis on things that don't matter. 
The disciples have been waiting for Jesus to go into Messiah mode from the day they first met him. They see glimpses of it, and now they're getting to Jerusalem. They ride in, they're like, yes, Messiah mode, activate. And then they see him saying to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. I am so sad. It feels overwhelming. God in the flesh. I mean, how, you're like, this is the Messiah. This is the hero. And the hero is saying, he feels overwhelmed. Right? That's what they say you're on an airplane. Everything's cool, even in turbulence, unless the flight attendants start getting panicked. If they look afraid, it's time to be afraid, right? That's the equivalent. Go, like the disciples are like, hey, Jesus has got this, except he feels overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He feels like he's dying. Where Messiah mode activate. Take these Romans and send them packing. That's what. Judas was anticipating, I'm going to force his hand, and then he's going to Messiah mode activate. And he kind of does, right? When they go to, uh, in John's gospel, when they go to address uh, address Jesus, this contingent of Roman soldiers, this legion of Roman soldiers in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he speaks, and they all get knocked down, and the disciples are like, yes, yes, come back again. And then he willingly surrenders to them. They're like, no, what are you doing? We want more of the Jesus speaking, knocking soldiers flat on their back, Messiah mode Jesus. And so they're waiting for that to happen. And then they see him or hear about him being crucified. And they're like, this is the worst day ever. And then they're waiting on Saturday in fear. That's what they're anxious about. They're next. And then they hear the good news of of Easter morning and they're not expecting it. And then Jesus is risen and then they interact with him. And he's like, hey, I'm ascending back to the Father, but I'm going to leave you with my presence. The Holy Spirit will be with you. And then they're waiting again for 10 days. Like a lot of the Christian life is waiting on God to do what God has promised to do. We may feel weary, empty, and consumed with a sense of failure and or defeat. Yet in these confusing in-between times, God is uprooting our self-will, our over-reliance on our self and what we do well. He strips us of layers of our false self and frees us from unhealthy attachments. The process of forgiving always involves grieving before we're able to let it go. I'm going to say that again. That's the thesis. The process of forgiving always involves grieving before letting go, both for the person who offers forgiveness as well as the person who asks for forgiveness. Forgiving a person who has hurt us deeply requires a miracle only God can do. But if we wait on him in that confusing in-between time, asking him to do what only he can do, such as soften and open our hearts, right? The question is not, can I forgive this person? Can you forgive this person? That's not the right question. The right question is, do you want to? Do you want to forgive that person? Answer, no. All right, like be honest, not what you ought to say to God, but what's really there. I have no desire to forgive this person for the wrong that they've done to me, for the hurt they've caused me and others. But if we wait with God in that confusing time and ask him to do it, he will do it. Running away from God and our pain during these seasons of disorientation does not heal our pain. It only makes the pain worse. To heal and grow, we must walk through the valley of the shadow of death on our way to the light. In the dark, we discover new things about God and about ourselves. As Barbara Brown Taylor said so well, I have learned things in the dark I could never have learned in the light. Things that saved, that saved not by life, that saved my life over and over again so that there's only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Seasons of burial, of waiting on God. Then lastly, resurrection. Before we get to the resurrection, I, I'm talking about, we're, we're, we're addressing the issue of shallow or superficial forgiveness. I love what Louis Schmid said in his book on forgiveness about shallow forgiveness. He says this, I meant to share this earlier, coming back to it. 
I worry about fast forgivers. We just stop there for a minute. I worry about fast forgivers. They tend to forgive quickly in order to avoid their pain. Do you know someone who does that? Or they forgive fast in order to get an advantage over the people they forgive. And their instant forgiving only makes things worse. I forgave you for that, remember? <laughs> Hypothetically again. Uh, so resurrection, that last phase on the journey, death, burial, resurrection is new life. Let the old birth the new. The central truth of our faith is that Jesus died a real death on a Roman cross and rose from the dead. That's the cup that Jesus is asking the Father to take for him. The cup is the cross. The cup, cru- the, the cup is, not the crop, the, <laughs> the cup is death by crucifixion. And we will celebrate that in earnest next week. But that truth is what enables us to affirm that our hurts and losses are gateways to new beginnings because through death comes life. We can affirm that losses and hurts are gateways to new beginnings because the Christian life is a cruciform life. Through death comes life. Resurrection is present. God is active. In fact, Jesus says it like this in John 12, 24. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Our hurts and losses are real. But so is the resurrection our living God brings from our losses. God invites us to trust him with the many losses and hurts we experience in our lives. And he can bring good out of it. It's Joseph at the end of his account in Genesis 50, 20, saying what you intended for evil. In fact, you intended it, it was evil. What you intended for evil, God has used for good. God's brought life and resurrection and newness out of it. He's turned horrible Friday into good Friday through his resurrection, as we sang earlier. The certainty of God's promise anchors us even when we feel we have descended into a hellish situation and there is no hope for a good future. What makes this third phase so different from the previous two is that we actually transition to something new. I know people who are really good at paying attention to their pain and losses and good at waiting on God, but they do not let go of the old so that they can transition into the new God has for them. We're we're like survivors of World War II who when the Allies freed them, opened the gates to the concentration camps, they walked out and some of them walked back in to the very barracks that were the the epitome of their hellish experience. Lice, Lice infected bunks. Why? Because they had grown accustomed to a learned helplessness. And they were not open to move with faith into God's future, at least in that moment. All right, as we wrap up, one of your next steps I want to encourage you to do is that iceberg exercise this week. Do that and email it to me. No, don't email it to me. Do that and then share it with God and share it. You're doing it before the Lord and then share it with a trusted, safe friend. Maybe your spouse, maybe a roommate, maybe your uh, uh, people in your small group. That's one. Two is grief loss chart. Grief loss chart. And that's what a grief loss chart is. So you're kind of breaking up your life wherever you're at in your life. I know some of you may be at that 19 to 25 age. God bless you there. Uh, but some of us are a little bit further down on the chart. No judgment. Seasoned veterans, if you will. And you say, okay, in that, those seasons of my life, what were the significant hurts and losses I experienced? And then what was my response to them at the time? I just kept going. I did my best job just to keep going. Keep on trucking. It's all right. Just like, it's not right or wrong. You're just saying what, what was, what happened. When I forgot to close the gate and our schnauzer got out and got hit by a car when I was a little kid, what did I do with that? If 
13 to 18, 19 to 25, 26 to 40, 41 to 60, 61. Do that. And sometimes it's help, for some of you, maybe more helpful to go linear and just like zero to where you are now and just mark the significant losses you've gone through in your life before the Lord. Hey, Lord, this is part of my journey. Thank you that you've been with me every step of the way. How was I responding then? How are you inviting me to respond now? Here's the thing about grief. We want grief to be linear. It's circular. Forgiveness, we want it to be linear. I forgave you or I didn't. Uh, it's circular. What do I mean by that? It's like, no, I forgive this person and then something happens. I see something and it just re-triggers those feelings. I'm walking back around. Here I come. Lord's like, oh, coming back around, Lord. Coming back again. I forgave that person. I know you did, Matt, but, there's, but what about this, you know? I was, talking to, I was sharing with someone that hurt me. I, I was sharing, this this morning, I was sharing with someone that hurt me. I haven't heard from this person in years. Literally just this morning. I was naming this to Roxanne. And they texted me. So, about something totally random. But it's like, okay, Lord, thanks for not watching me. Uh, <laughs> gr- forgiveness is circular. There's more like layers of an onion. Jerry Sitzer, I want to close with this this morning. Jerry Sitzer, professor, author, you may know his story. He wrote, wrote about it in A Grace Disguised, where he and his young family were on their way back home. They were in rural Idaho when a drunk driver crossed over, hit them head on, killing three generations of their family, his mom, his wife, and one of his daughters. And he writes about his grieving journey that he says comes back around. When one of my daughters, three of my daughters survived, thankfully. They had injuries, but they survived. One of my daughters, when she got married, were coming back around. And I put flowers in the seat next to me at the wedding to remember, 29 years ago, to remember the loss of my wife and my other daughter come back around. And he said, when we were about an hour from the hospital. We're out in rural Idaho. And when paramedics and ambulance arrived on the scene, they, they took me and my girls to the hospital. He said, I would say I was in a place of shock. But he said, that ride was so sacred. The emergency workers knew enough not to say anything to me or my daughter, but just to let us be. And he said, in that moment, I knew I was going to have to forgive this person who had caused this. And I was not ready to. But then he said this, but I knew the bleeding of this event stops with me. I'm not going to carry resentment and bitterness deeply through my life so that it affects my other three daughters. And that trauma gets, they're already walking through trauma, but the trauma of the, an angry, resentful, bitter dad negatively impacts them. They've been through enough. So I knew I had to do the work of forgiving that person because the bleeding stops with me. That's the invitation. You're putting a stake in the ground and you're saying, Lord, I didn't want this, but I pray, God, your will be done. I surrender. I'm requesting you change this circumstance, but I'm also relinquishing my sense of control. I'm putting it in your hands and I'm saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm yours, Lord. My life is in your hands and the bleeding stops by the grace of God with me. We're charting a new course in our family. The dysfunction, the sinful, unhealthy patterns of not dealing with loss stops with me. That's the invitation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning. And we thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to step into that moment with all that you are and saying, I feel overwhelmed. But then to rise up from that. In fact, in the account that's found in Mark's gospel, he said, an angel from heaven, as Jesus is on his knees before the Father, an angel from heaven appears and strengthens him. A messenger of God shows up in his hour of greatest need when his own friends are fast asleep. But the angel of God shows up and strengthens him. 
May God himself, through the presence of his spirit, show up in your heart today and strengthen you for the road ahead. Yes, Lord, we say yes to that, to your will and to your way. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us. And Lord, as you forgive us our sins, of our wrongs, of our trespasses, may we, by your grace, grieve, lament, and forgive those who have sinned against and wronged us. We ask that today in Jesus' name. Amen.